good afternoon. It's a difficult act to follow, uh, but I'll do my best. Uh, the, um, here we are. Uh, well, we've had um, some summaries of the book, so I won't uh, delay, but there are three parts to the book, which I think are very, uh, very interesting. One of them, the, uh, how the system uh, doesn't work, the second one on how you can manage your capital account better, and the third one on the reforms that uh, Jose Antonio proposes. And I think it should promote a very interesting academic and policy debate uh, starting uh, here and now. And as he pointed out, it's, uh, the book is available uh, free from the Oxford University Press due, due to the generosity of wider. So there's absolutely no excuse for not reading. <laughs> um, the, uh, there are two graphs in the book There we are. There are two graphs in the book which sort of summarize some of what's been said. Uh, one of which is this, uh, the one on the left, which indicates the scale of uh, IMF lending, which is very, very, very small in relation to the size of the shocks uh, that we're talking about. I mean, it really is minuscule. Uh, so, I mean, the argument about scale, and also uh, after the crisis of the 80s, the relative scale of IMF lending has been declining uh, steadily. Uh, so uh, part, in a way, of uh, Jose Antonio's uh, argument is not that the IMF should grow, but just it should re uh, recover its previous size or stop shrinking as uh, part of the argument. Uh, the second thing that's been referred to a number of times is the amount of uh, unilateral uh, self-insurance by countries in accumulating reserves. But of course, it's worth pointing out that as a result of the recent crisis, those reserves have been run down, particularly by uh, China. So in a sense, they uh, played their role. Um, but still, uh, reserve levels, uh, what these indicate is uh, self-insurance uh, by individual countries rather than collective insurance. Now, he makes very bold institutional proposals. He proposes a new global reserve system uh, with SDRs and a currency basket, a better G20 macroeconomic coordination, including uh, ex uh, exchange rate target zones, which he didn't mention, but uh, would be a return to a sort of managed uh, quasi-fixed exchange rate system, better uh, crisis management, which we've discussed. Sorry, this isn't my fault. Oh, good Lord. That's oh, gone off. Oh, yeah. There we are. And uh, better um, uh, international governance, which is what uh, uh, Joe was talking about. Now, part of the problem is we keep on talking about these external shocks and making broad references to um, uh, 2008 and so on. But I think we have to look at a bit more detail of where these shocks come from. And the central argument I'm making is that the private sector dominates in all these flows, unless we understand what the private sector is up to and where these fluctuations come from, we have very little chance in trying to cope with them just by public uh, sector activities. Sorry about this. Oh, there we are. So where do they come from? Well, the first point is this is no longer a Bretton Woods world. We would like it to be so, but it isn't a world where uh, capital flows are administered by governments as they were uh, originally after the war, uh, they are completely out of the control of governments in that sense. Um, and the point I'm making, I want to make now, is that asset demand is crucial. That is the demand by private sector of for emerging market assets is what is driving the market. And that this demand goes up and down due to factors which have got very little to do with the fundamentals in the country's concern. And unless we address the question of asset demand, uh, what we do at the moment is to address the question of emerging market asset supply, that is how much debt they have uh, and so on, and, how, and uh, extra resources they might or might not have, but we don't look at demand fluctuations, which is where I think a lot of the problem uh, comes from. Um, I think you also have to take a balance sheet approach, that is we keep on talking about loans and, and, and reserves and so on, but everybody's asset is somebody else's liability and vice versa. So all these emerging market liabilities are someone else's asset. Uh, 
And the key problem is of people trying to sell those assets. And in a sense, what the fund does or the central bank does is buy those assets off the private sector and give the private sector another asset that it wants. Right? Uh, and that is the crucial uh, transaction that takes place. So the key issue uh, is uh, not just uh, fundamentals, um, whatever these fundamentals might be, uh, but also, crucially, factors such as contagion, uncertainty, return on other assets, and changes in risk appetite and innovation from the investor's point of view. And it's what determines investor behavior uh, is what concerns me. And I think any form of regulation that's going to work, global regulation or national regulation, has to address the, the, directly the issue of investor behavior. Just to illustrate the problem, uh, these are some graphs from the... Uh, IMF's um, Global uh, Financial Stability Report. I don't want to uh, uh, speak about them in great length, but I just want to point out that, uh, for example, if we take this one, this is the IMF's own commentary on these fluctuations. You've got the Greek uh, crisis uh, causing a sell-off across all emerging markets. You've got the Irish crisis causing another sell-off. You've got the first ECB expansion causing another wave of sell-offs. You've got the temper, tra temper tra tantrum again, right? Uh, none of these have got anything to do with most of them. Uh, China equity sell-off again has an uh, effect throughout emerging markets. Uh, and, and, and the US presidential election also is a great source <laughs> of instability in them. What I'm getting at is these are not just once in a lifetime events like 97 or 2008. These are continual year by year, year by year, large fluctuations which are brought about by conditions uh, completely alien to uh, most uh, emerging markets. Uh, and again, I don't want to dwell on this, but you can see the corresponding changes in inflows into and out of developing countries as a consequence of these various shocks. Now, there's only one equation. I'm sorry about this, but it really is necessary. Uh, there we are. Uh, if you pardon me. Uh, this is just your standard portfolio theory and just is uh, in an optimal portfolio explains the share of emerging market assets that you have in your portfolio is a function of the returns in the emerging market but also the returns in uh, other markets, I mean particularly your home market and other uh, emerging markets. Uh, but a major factor in this is your degree of risk aversion. Right? And one of my arguments is that the degree of risk aversion is determined what is going on on other U.S. markets, U.S. Uh, junk bond markets or, uh, or political uncertainty and so on. And also the degree not only of volatility in the emerging market itself, i.e. the fundamentals, but also in the home market, the degree of volatility and the covariance between the volatility in the home market and the emerging markets, right? So there are a large number of factors that are, quite, are not fundamentals of Chile or South Africa, but are, if you like, uh, external factors which generate these, these shocks. Um, and my suggest, my, what I want to argue is that the very interesting proposals that we've been hearing about uh, from uh, my three co-panelists don't really address what to do about these factors and how these might be stabilized. Um, the consequences are of, of, of this uh, problem, which are uh, that there's extraordinarily high degree of co-movement uh, in different regions of the sovereign spreads. As you can see that all the regions move together with a, uh, some of them more extreme than others due to uh, either the high degree of risk aversion on the one hand or their own idiosyncratic shocks. But they all, the different, uh, this is the EMBI index, which is the difference between, it's the sovereign spread, the difference between the return on dollar bonds from Chile and uh, the US uh, uh, dollar uh, interest rate. Uh, and you can see that they, they do tend to move together. So there is a co-movement, which I would argue is generated in the markets of the north. Right? Uh, and this uh, is what really has to be addressed. Now, again, risk aversion moves radically as well. Uh, the VIX, which is the uh, Chicago market of, uh, in risk, it's actually technically the price uh, paid uh, 
uh, if you like, to ensure against fluctuations in the Standard & Poor's 500 index over the next 30 days, but it's the standard measure of risk aversion. Now, of course, that risk aversion should change and change so markedly and so rapidly and so largely is a real problem for all neoclassical economists because, of course, risk aversion is derived from the second derivative of the utility curve and, in consequence, must be stable because if risk aversion is not stable, the entire edifice collapses of utility-based uh, economic theory. But if, as I think we all are here, are fairly unreconstructed Keynesians, that doesn't matter to us too much. <laughs> but uh, it is important to see how rapidly risk aversion changes and how on a, what, what a large scale. Right? And given if risk aversion changes due to changes in the US market, then obviously the, uh, if we go back to the formula, which I won't do, but that suddenly has an enormous impact on the amount of emerging market assets that you want to hold, and that in turn will have a huge effect on, on these fluctuations. Um, uh, so this uh, analysis turns out also to be a sort of undermining of uh, the biblical, biblical truths that we were taught in Economics 101. Uh, so coming back to that, supposing we take this more private sector uh, balance sheet or asset demand approach uh, to the issue, uh, which I think is essential if we're going to understand what's going on and thus um, uh, look at reform proposals. Uh, what does this mean for Jose Antonio's proposals in his book? Well, I think firstly it, it reveals that the private capital foes are systemically unstable. Right? It's not that they are uh, unstable in some dreadful crisis period or something. They are unstable on a daily basis, they are intrinsically unstable. It's not that there's been some terrible uh, shock in 2008 or in 1997. It just became more visible then. Right? Um, and uh, the question is how much or how little does the international financial system do to uh, stabilize these? Well, of course, it does do something. I mean, the, uh, one of the things about reserve positions that government, that, uh, countries hold is they are also for daily and monthly fluctuations. I mean, they uh, not only for long, uh, enormous shocks. Um, uh, but they, uh, I don't think that the current proposal for the reserve lending for capital controls and so on, which basically acting on the asset supply side, right, on the supply of asset, emerging market assets, are really doing anything to stabilize fluctuations in demand for emerging market assets. The uh, the second thing is the present approach basically means that you swap, that the IMF or somebody uh, swaps or stands credi credibly ready to swap the assets that pri private sectors don't, the private sector doesn't want, right, and to exchange those for some assets that it does want, which are ultimately backed by the U.S. Treasury, I suppose. I mean, in the end, that, that is what you're getting. Um, uh, and then wait until normal conditions return. Uh, so in a sense, it's a, uh, an ultimate insurance policy. But there's no attempt to counter the origins of the shock, just to uh, palliate it and, and wait for it to go away. Now, part of the solution clearly lies in G20 macro-financial coordination to reduce the fluctuations on the home or the northern market, as Jose Antonio suggests. But I find it very difficult to see how this new committee is going to have uh, much authority because, as um, uh, Stephanie pointed out, even within the Eurozone, they can't, uh, can't get their act together, I mean, uh, to, to, uh, to do very much. Uh, but it does mean that we must have greater concern for externalities. So what could be done? It's no good me just sitting here criticizing and saying that all my colleagues are missing something. Uh, I, I have a moral responsibility to say what could be done. Um, uh, the first one is, I think, and this is running a bit in the same direction as Stephanie was, is what I would call the resegmentation of the markets. That is to say that if particular markets like mortgage markets or uh, emerging market funds and so on were segmented in the sense that they weren't just... Uh, traded on, on short-term markets, but uh, were held by particular classes of investors, like pension funds or 
long-term insurance funds and so on, uh, you could get some stabilization, right? So that you would, uh, you, you would uh, use the longer-term demand uh, part of the market uh, to stabilize particular markets. It's always been true in, 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 in continental Europe uh, here, for example, that mortgage markets have been stabilized by making them a, legally an asset that must be held uh, by um, uh, uh, banks and insurance companies and so on and so forth. So that's what I mean by market segmentation. And it's that market segmentation that has been broken down during the uh, financial reforms, right? So the whole, the entire market, ranging from uh, mortgages uh, to uh, long-term industrial finance and so on, has become dominated by the money market and by short-term fluctuations. So a lot of the proposals around, like, for example, uh, Jose Antonio's other book on, uh, uh, on uh, development banks, are basically resegmenting the market. That is to say, they are uh, creating a separate market uh, for long-term development finance, which is not subject to the short-term fluctuations. So I'd argue that part of the answer goes along there. But it must be also co combined with uh, market-making obligations for bond issuers. That's to say that if a developing country issues a bond, uh, a, uh, a bank in London or New York makes an enormous amount of money out of uh, floating the issue, uh, but they don't actually have any responsibility for making a market anymore in that issue. Right? And so there's no liquidity. So one of the reasons why uh, people sell off Argentine bonds is not because they feel Argentine, Argentina is going down the, uh, down the plug hole, though it may be, but uh, uh, the, uh, they, not just that. It's because they feel that they can't sell this paper, right? that they can't find a buyer for it, right? and they sell it as soon as they can. If somebody uh, is making a market in those assets, just as much as central banks make a market in domestic government bonds. Right? So domestic bond markets are more stable because you always know you can sell it back to the central bank. Right? It makes the market. But we don't have any market makers in emerging market issues. So the issue for me is whether, for example, for example, the regional development banks could act as market makers. That doesn't make them the lenders. It makes them the market maker, that they stand ready as a secondary market support to buy and sell the bonds issued by uh, emerging markets. Uh, and that would give more stability and liquidity to the market and prevent these enormous uh, fluctuations. Uh, by the same extension, I think uh, that the lender of last uh, resort function of the IMF or of whatever body that you agree to look at, uh, in terms of market liquidity, that is not just making loans, but of standing ready to buy and trade in uh, government issues, right? providing the liquidity is exactly what the European Central Bank does, right? but not what the IMF does, right? uh, so that it's making a market and providing liquidity, and that reduces the risk to investors, right? because they know that they can always sell at whatever the current uh, list price is, and it may go down tomorrow, but it's not, they're not going to get stuck in a situation where they can't offload the, the paper, which is what causes uh, market collapses. Um, and I think this would be much more productive than just uh, de debt rollovers that are present or balance of pay payments loans and so on, which don't actually tackle uh, th this issue at all. The third point, I think, is that uh, when we're looking at domestic bank regulation, that bank regulation must include currency balance sheet mismatches. That is to say, it's not just... Uh, about the uh, balance sheet itself or the risk. Uh, the major risk to emerging market banks is the currency mismatch. Right? Uh, and I think that, uh, in, in effect, one of the most effective forms of capital controls is actually strict regulation of currency mismatch in the banking system, right? which is where the problem turns up. But I'd also argue, and I think some of the Brazilian experience is interesting in this way, that banks should be uh, judged also on the currency mismatch of their major clients. Uh, in other words, that it's no good just shifting the currency mismatch out of the banks <laughs> into the corporate sector of Brazil or anywhere else. Right? Uh, those banks themselves, their regulators, uh, or either, I don't think it's possible to directly regulate the balance sheets of firms, but you can make some progress towards that in the risk model for banks has to include the balance sheets of their major clients. Right? 
so that, in effect, means you're regulating corporate balance sheets, what it means, in effect. Uh, now, I think that sort of approach makes it quite different, because then we're talking about affecting private sector behavior and stabilizing private sector behavior, rather than always running along with public sector behavior after the act uh, and trying to compensate for things.